your skin, that shit is popping, girl. Body on ten, damn, you got it, girl. You got a boss up, getting them checks, living your best, racks up. Session every weekend with Sunday School with Lex. Connect with like-minded black women every Sunday at 6 on the Lexus Exodus platform where we have live panels and call-in shows in order to connect and share our stories, discuss divestment and other important topics pertaining to the plights of black women, discuss self-empowerment and self-improvement, and much, much more. Tune in every Sunday at 6 p.m. ET at patreon.com slash Lexus Exodus. See you soon. Hey, boos, hey. It is Lexus Exodus, leader of the Black Women Exodus. How are y'all doing? And like always, if you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe. Please share. Please comment in the comment section. Let me know that you're listening. Also, if you enjoy listening to my content on the go, the show is now available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts for audio listeners. Go check out my Patreon community where you can get access to bonus episodes and exclusive content and also a private community of like-minded, divested women. It is linked below. Please also follow me on social media platforms. You can check me out everywhere on all platforms at Lexis Exodus. I also have a backup channel just in case something happens to this one. It is called Lex X. That's L-E-X-E-X. You can find all of this information in the description below. This is another installment of my series called The Blackistan Zoo, where we profile the dusty derelicts, crazy creatures, and animals in Blackistan. So last week, we kicked off Black History Month and began to have a conversation about retro dust. We talked about back in the day dust, throwback dusties, and how nig has been nogging. This ain't nothing new. So let's keep the trend going and continue to discuss throwback dusties. Let's talk about historical dust and how historically for years, for decades, for centuries, these niggas have always been problematic, despite them trying to act like this is a problem with the new generation of black males. So we talked about how people in the Black community love to be nostalgic and to romanticize the Black males from back in the day. They like to pretend that Black people lived in this utopia, this sitcom, fairy tale, leave it to beaver worlds where everything was rainbows and roses. They talk about Black Wall Street. They talk about Black businesses booming back in the day. According to them, the Black family was thriving, and all the men were hardworking and honest. They all loved their families. They were model, respectable citizens who went to work and came home. And also, they liked to laud them for courageously fighting for civil rights for Black people. This is not true, y'all. This is hogwash. Everybody lied. This is bull. In fact, all of these so-called leaders that we were brainwashed and told to blindly revere in love in the white community. They were treasonous, they were dishonest, and they had no loyalty or integrity. They hated being black. They hated their black wives and their children. Many of them were philanderers and womanizers who strived to abolish slavery and to end segregation simply because they were white worshiping. And they wanted to be able to nest in brass community and to be able to lay up with white women. In fact, many of them hated being black and they hated black women so much that they would brutally beat and abuse many black women. All right, so we will talk about it tonight. And shout out to loyal subby Finn Fatel, who contributed the idea of tonight's show and also shared several clips that illustrate what we're talking about tonight. Okay. 
So let's get to it. I want to look at this first throwback clip of them showing their butts, showing their black behinds with this trash ass song from back in the day from 1940. So let's watch this and then we'll talk. Do y'all hear this? Do y'all hear this? And if you had a hard time trying to understand what these Nick Nogs are singing, they're singing in unison. They're singing in harmony, crooning about not wanting no jet black woman. I don't want no bald head woman because she too mean, she too mean. When you meet my long haired woman, just bow your head, law, just bow your head. I don't want no jet black woman because she too mean y'all this is what they were singing about in 1948 singing a little dusty hearts out talking about they don't want no black women mind you the caption of this original video if you look at it says that this was recorded from parchman farm in mississippi y'all parchman farm is a damn prison <laughs> Y'all, so th this is the level of ridiculousness. So these were Dignocks who were locked up in prison, plantation style. They were a part of a chain gang, harmonizing, hooping and hollering about not wanting black women decades ago, about 60 years ago. So all of these podcasts and Nick Nogs, all of, these, all of these relationship gurus who go viral on social media for spewing hateful content directed towards Black women, that is nothing new. They've been saying this. It's just more visible now because social media exists to document it. The vile, vitriolic, misogynoir that we see today has always existed. Where do you think these younger generations of Nick Nogs learned it from? They've been that way. They've been hateful and always engaged in demeaning and degrading behavior of Black women because they were historical dusties. Okay? So y'all still don't believe me? Y'all still don't believe me? Well, let's really get into it. So I came across this series by a sister named Cecilia Regina275 on TikTok. And I'm going to link her channel below because I believe she is absolutely brilliant. So again, that's Cecilia Regina275 on TikTok. I'll link her below. Go follow her. She has created an incredible social media series where she really exposes it all when it comes to these historical dusties. So let's first talk about W.E.B. Du Bois, y'all. Child. So let's watch this and then we'll talk through. While Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois is famous for his theories on black culture. He also wrote fiction. In his famous speculative fiction story, The Comet, which has been said to father Afrofuturism, a comet hits Earth and it seems that a black man and a white girl, Jim and Julia, are the only people left alive. Uh, he protects her, helps her search for her fiance. They can't find him. Then they climb into bed and are just about to, quote, father a new race when her father and a slew of other white men, including her fiance, come in. Turns out only New York was destroyed when the comet hit and they were outside the city. Anyhow, they're about to lynch Jim when Julia convinces them not to. They offer him some money and then he wanders to the street where his black wife finds him at the end. Uh, note, he was never looking for her at all. So, one of the most prolific figures in black culture is super comfortable imagining a future without black women as a distant second to be taken and enjoyed when white women are not available. They tell on themselves every time. What did this black man living in post-slavery Jim Crow America imagine as the future? Not equality, not even the white people being destroyed or taken away so the black people could live in peace and harmony. This is science fiction. He could have imagined literally any type of future he wanted. And what did he imagine? A black working class man with access to a white girl but not just any white girl she's rich and unmarried so being depicted as a virgin she has access to all the things he didn't have before the world ended a nice brownstone a car and he's living in her house and driving her car 
Sounds familiar. Anyway, she's naive and does anything he says. And let me tell you, he didn't waste one minute mourning his family or his wife before hopping in bed with Julia. He calls her the mighty mother of all men to come and the bride of life. How is a white woman going to be the mother of all men when that's literally genetically what black women are? People are like, why all the focus on historical figures? It's just one bad man, two bad men, three bad men. No. This is important because these are men whose work is the blueprint for the Black community. Their work is still required reading today if you want a degree in African American studies, Black literature, anything. So how they treated Black women and how they mentally wanted to erase us is very important. This is what your community is based on. Your activism, your Black literary theory, all of it is about standing on your back. And the idea that you are expendable has been built into the framework. You cannot make that better. You can't improve it. Put yourself first, women. Get away from this toxicity. And just to add a bit more context, he was one of the founders of the NAACP, and he talks about uh, in his biography how the first time he knew he was black was on Valentine's Day when he tried to give a valentine to a little white girl, and she rejected it, and how sad and formative that was. So it's just the same story over and over again, women. Wake up. Ciao. This is absolutely ridiculous, y'all. Like, I can't even laugh at this because it's so sad. Like, this is how pathetic whack men are and have always been. So the dog literally made this science fiction book, wrote this novel of a fantasy land where in the midst of an apocalypse, y'all, everything is magically okay because at least he gets to screw a white woman. Like, this is how sad and desperate and dusty and thirsty they are. It can be the end of the world, y'all. Everybody gone. It could be the walking dead child. Just zombies everywhere. <laughs> zombies just eating brains and stuff and eating eating people's legs like chicken. Niggas still going to aspire to find them a Becky. Not water, not shelter. They're not going to try to rebuild society or try to save humanity. Not food, not his wife and family. He said F his kids. A random damn white woman, y'all. To the point where he decided to document in his autobiography how he was rejected by a white girl when he was a little kid and tried to give her a valentine. That's what that's what gave him his consciousness, according to him, and made him realize he was a black person. And that caused him so much discomfort and so much mental anguish that he became this, uh, this quote unquote legendary abolitionist. Y'all, this is who we're supposed to respect and honor every February. Writing fantasy novels about the world's ending, and he gets to finally fuck a white woman. Child, I can't. So let's keep going. I want to talk about Frederick Douglass next, another historical dusty, y'all. So let's watch this, and then we will talk through. Put his shorty on. Six and six. The video I'm stitching is a conversation on who is more dangerous to oppression, educated black men or educated black women. And I think the answer to that question can be seen in the example of Frederick Douglass. Um, he taught himself how to read, used that literacy to aid in his liberation, is quoted on saying, like, once you know how to read, you will forever be free and was married to a black woman for 20 plus years and never taught her how to read. This is exactly why I am self first and not race first. So Anna Murray Douglas was born free. She worked herself to death for Frederick Douglass. If it weren't for her, there would be no Frederick Douglass. She actually freed him. Uh, you'll notice his first attempt in Narrative of Life of Frederick Douglass, he got caught. He was returned to slavery. It was her who helped set him free in a more lasting way. Uh, she did factory work to support his newspaper, The North Star. And he would ship his laundry to her from Britain. And she had to haul water by hand from the well in order to wash his clothes pay to mail them back and that's just a sample of the work that she did for him so anyway she got down sick with rheumatoid arthritis could not move and he thought this was the time to move his mistress into her house his white mistress by the way you know this is the reality of being race first it's never going to serve you and if you go now to visit the Frederick Douglass house in Maryland, she's been erased 
you know, the only thing that they say is that she was a good housekeeper and she gave him a standard of living that was far beyond most African-Americans at the time could achieve. His second wife, the white one, gets credited with preserving his legacy when if it hadn't been for Anna Murray, there would have been no legacy to preserve to begin with. And the truth is we owe her for whatever measure of freedom Frederick Douglass gained for himself and for us. Without her money, her work, her efforts, he would have been nothing. And she is not even really a footnote in his legacy. Most people don't know who she is or her name. Don't do it. Put yourself first. You know, don't worry about, you know, who puts the race on more, who gives more. Oh, what? Put yourself So on. the hypocrisy of Black men never fails to amuse me. Uh, if some black men see a black woman in a happy, nurturing relationship with a white man, the first thing they're going to go do is invoke the specter of slavery. You know, how can you be with him? Oh, they were our slave masters, bedwinch, mammy, all that other. Uh, conveniently forgetting that there were plenty of ex-slave men who actually married white women. So abolitionists like Frederick Douglass and uh, Equiano here made a fortune preaching about the evils of slavery and use it to support their white wives. So what's really popping? And then there were others like uh, Charles Ball here who wrote about his sexual relationships with white women in his slave narrative. So again, what's happening here? Reminds me of another black leader, Eldridge Cleaver, who said black women reminded him of slavery and white women were freedom. These men are sick. <laughs> so what I need Black women to realize is that a lot of these men have a psychosis, period. They do not want to see Black women being treated well by anyone, and they have all the excuses in the world as to why you should be suffering. Do not fall for this foolishness. Get out while you can and put yourself first. Child, did y'all hear this? Did y'all hear this? I thank God for social media and for the TikTok historians and for the people on the internet who aren't afraid to call a thing a thing. Again, this woman's name is Cecilia Regina275 on TikTok. I encourage you guys to follow her. Um, this series is excellent. Um, she even mentions Eldridge Cleaver in here, which y'all, I'm going to have to chop this up into segments and do a part two of this video just because the floodgates open. I mean, Indigo Savage sent me some things. Shout out to her in the private group. Brooke also did as well. So much content about how treasonous and how disgusting these dusty whack mills were back in the day. And let our textbooks tell it, Frederick Douglass was this incredible abolitionist who was intelligent and had integrity and fought against oppression and slavery. Whole time, he was subjugating and oppressing his Black wife. Child, and she goes through one by one all of these dusties who was on this bull crap. She talks about how Frederick Douglass could read and write as a slave. He was literate. He was married to his Black wife for 20 years, y'all, but never taught her how to read. Yet she was the one who freed him from slavery, and she worked like a mule to support his endeavors. The man shipped his laundry to her overseas so she could wash his dirty drawers from a different continent, y'all. She was his ride or die, his mule, his maid. I was your lover and your secretary. <laughs> and I, I'm just joking, but this really isn't funny because she really was the reason his newspaper, The North Star, grew so popular and why he is so widely known today. And she ended up getting sick and he left her to die for a white woman. Now, no one knows who this woman is and no one knows anything about her significant contributions. Sis says they describe her as a maid in textbooks and in museums. When she made his career and she had a prominent role and played this crucial part in history and in abolishing slavery, she's being referred to as the maid now. As a matter of fact, if you Google his wife, his first wife, you're going to be inundated with articles about the white mistress that he later married, Helen Pitts. Okay, so and his first wife was the reason he was able to accomplish all these feats. She's an afterthought now. Ain't no trophies for a ride or die, only suffering and scars, y'all. These niggas been on this BS. Even the so-called legendary honorable ones who they like to call y'all's leaders. 
Even during slavery days, they were simply historically dusty. Child, so let's get to Martin Luther King, y'all. Let's watch this and then we'll talk through it. Do I preach self first for black women because you will never be enough for someone who wants something else. Today's example is MLK who married Coretta Scott and then cheated on her left, right and center with a bunch of white scallywags, probably because they reminded him of the low class white woman who was his first love. Some of you may not know this, but he was engaged before Coretta to a white woman called Betty Moitz. So this article has more information, but all you need to know is that Betty was a cafeteria lady at the university where MLK got his doctorate. After he graduated from Morehouse, he went to Kreuzer up north to get his PhD. And Betty was a cafeteria lady there, not a college student, not a socialite, a lunch lady. Unless you think I'm being a hater and secretly she was very deep, here's what she said about their relationship. I listened, Betty says, and he'd just talk and talk. She was listening because she had nothing to say. How could she contribute? Here was a man with world-changing ideas and a woman who probably didn't graduate from high school. What was the attraction? Marcus Woods, King's friend, recalls he was rather proud of the fact he was able to socialize openly with a white girl. There it is. And this, Betty says, he was always trying to get me to go with him to restaurants in Chester. I was embarrassed to let him know I had never been to any of those places. In those days, who went to restaurants? Well, people with money, Betty. That's who. Betty was born and raised in poverty, but MLK was a child of privilege. So why insist on a relationship with a woman who was not socially, economically, or intellectually his equal? Because she was white. That's not news. People often say men like this get the leftover white women, and that's true. But yet you notice these same men have absurdly high criteria for black women. Look at Coretta, educated, good background, pretty, brilliant, a superwoman. She was a trained opera singer, gave it all up for MLK. And what was Betty Moritz? White. Do you think for a second MLK would have entertained the idea of marriage to an uneducated, unattractive black woman cafeteria lady? Yeah. I didn't think so. So this is part two. I didn't want to rush this part uh, just to continue with my video. I'm stitching with myself. So how often has a black man, a celebrity or otherwise, listed all the 10,000 qualities he wanted in a black woman only to marry a white woman who had none of that? You will never be good enough for someone who is looking for an excuse. These women, their only qualification is whiteness. And I've discussed this at length in the past, but these men are just trying to get some societal prestige with these women. And they think anything with white or non-black skin is a win because they're trying to move up within a social hierarchy that is set up by white men instead of setting up their own hierarchy like you know real men but whatever so all this other stuff colorism featureism hair texturism the fact that the only black women who they sometimes praise are those who are white adjacent who look white who are mixed it all comes from the same mindset so don't play that game you cannot win because these girls who get the praise the perfect girls like Coretta they're getting a booby prize yeah MLK married her and then he made her miserable why well, Reverend Pius Barber, King's mentor, said that the relationship with Betty Moitz left King as, quote, a man with a broken heart. He never recovered. In other words, no matter how perfect you are, black girl, black woman, you cannot appease a black man who is set on whiteness. You know, he married a perfect woman and spent his life mourning over a cafeteria woman. Yikes. Well, go ahead and drag, sis. Go ahead with the educated, intellectual, cool, calm, and collected, nice, nasty read, child. Ooh, that was nice, nasty. I just love a Black woman who can drag and snatch edges so effortlessly like this. She don't got to hoop and holler. She ain't got to snap her neck. She ain't got to use vulgarities. She ain't got to fuss and cuss people out. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that because y'all know I'm with the bullish too <laughs> when I'm in the mood to cut somebody out and gather them together. But I'm just saying I can appreciate a black woman who ain't got to do none of that and can give a nice, nasty tongue lashing without breaking a sweat. 
says I love you. Um, I don't know if you guys are connected to her or follow her or have her contact. Tell her to come to YouTube, sis. If you do, I will be the first to promote your channel. I think you're brilliant. I really, really enjoyed watching your content on TikTok. She done gave an educated, nice, nasty read. Like a church lady read, y'all. So this woman does an expose of MLK in just a few minutes. And this is nothing new, right? Because this is old information. We all know that Martin Luther King was a philanderer and a cheater. And he loved white women. In fact, he cheated on his beautiful black wife with many white women. But I didn't realize it was this bad. So he was so desperate to be in close proximity to white women. He slept with the lunch lady, y'all. She said herself, she was a high school dropout and a barnyard Becky. She grew up broke as hell to the point that she couldn't even contribute to the conversation that he was having on dates because she was so damn dumb and uneducated. And he was holding her around like a trophy. He was engaged to her. And after they broke up, he was so heartbroken that he continued to look for her and other white mistresses after he married his beautiful black wife, Coretta. And Coretta Scott King was everything. She was gorgeous. She was educated. She went to a very reputable, esteemed school here in Ohio. She has multiple degrees. She was a classically trained opera singer, y'all, for God's sake. Not only that, she was ride or die. And she was an activist, risking her life right alongside next to MLK on the front lines. While he was parading around with a bunch of damn lunch ladies, cheating on her. They been dusty. They been trash, y'all. They were just historical dusties. Child. So this can go on and on and on. Like I said, I have so much content. Um, I'll have to do a part two. But for now, I want to close this out by looking at this last video about the founder of Kwanzaa, y'all. So the Black holiday that's supposed to celebrate Black values in the Black community. Well, let's talk about the atrocious documented history the founder of Kwanzaa has being malicious and being abusive towards Black women. Happy Kwanzaa, my brothers and sisters. Let's unite to roast this Kwanzaa pig. Don Maulana Karenga, who beat and tortured Black women and who was involved in the death of a member of the Black Panther Party. We know that he is a, and often considered the, founder of Kwanzaa. He is also a professor of African American studies. He is also an author and is still called an activist. And it was in his twisted, perverted activism where his most heinous crimes were committed in the 1960s and 70s. In 1971, just five years after the founding of Ron Karinga's holiday, he was convicted of felonious assault and false imprisonment for torturing two women who were members of his US organization at his Inglewood, California home, crimes for which he served four years in prison. The victims, Deborah Jones and Gail Davis, both 20 years old at the time, said that they were at Ron Karenga's home when, in a drug-induced fit, he accused them of trying to kill him by placing crystals in his food and water and in various areas of his house. The women were told to remove their clothes. Then, naked, they were beaten with an electrical cord and also with a karate baton. They were hit on their heads with toasters. A hot soldering iron was put in Gail Davis's mouth and against her face. One of Deborah Jones' big toes was placed in a vise, which was ordered to be tightened by one of the defendants. The following day, Ron Karenga told the women that, quote, Vietnamese torture is nothing compared to what I know, end quote. Luz Tamayo, the second defendant, and you'll want to remember that name, her name, reportedly put detergent in their mouths. Lewis Smith, another defendant, turned a water hose on them so that the hot water was running full force on their faces, and Ron Karinga, holding a gun, threatened to shoot both of the women. Thankfully, he didn't shoot them, but he did, according to sources, burn both of the women with lit cigarettes, 
and insert a water hose into their vaginas while forcing alternately cold and very hot water into them. During the trial, the scars and cuts on Deborah Jones' back were shown to the jury. Y'all see this mess? Did y'all hear this? And I'm so sorry to share such a graphic story like this, but it's important to me to spread awareness about those you've been conditioned and brainwashed to respect and idolize and exalt in this community. So this dude was a strung out druggie, first off. He had to have been a crackhead. I don't think crack was around in the 70s, but he was on something. In the 70s, everybody was experimenting with hallucinogens and these psychedelic weird drugs. And so during a drug-induced rage, he got paranoid. And he turned on two Black women within his own organization and brutally beat and tortured them and even S.A. them. Child, the article said that he beat them with electrical cords. He burnt them with cigarettes. He even utilized water hoses to assault them. So he was an effing weirdo, right? And guess what the kicker is? Y'all saw where the creator of this video said a woman named Luz Tamayo helped torture these women by forcing them to drink detergent. That was an ignog Mexican wife, y'all. So this is what I mean, the white community being trash. So they'll like to, to go around gloating about the 50s and the 60s and these so-called golden eras, these olden days, like it was leave it to beaver everywhere and step for wise within the white community. When in reality, this is what was truly happening, okay? Because this is supposed to be the white community's best and brightest. And this is what they were doing. This is what the Dusties were doing behind closed doors while the women were doing the real work, while the women were arming themselves and marching in the streets and putting themselves on the front line, they were out here abusing them and then also effing white women at every chance that they could get. Y'all, niggas been misogynist. They've been treasonous. They've been abusive. They've been trash. They've been hateful and vitriolic and inflicting harm and pain on black women. They've been historical dusties. Child, again, I'm going to cut this right here. Otherwise, this will get very, very long. Again, we'll continue this and we'll pick up where we left off because you guys flooded me with content that's like this. If you have any additional stories that you want me to feature about historical dusties, please feel free to leave it down below. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, see you guys. Bye. I don't a red iPhone. Can you please bring it to the sound stage? Red iPhone, appreciate it.